today we are going to talk about tools that will help you write um, consistent Python code base across your projects and your teams. And uh, we'll see how we can automate that um, with pre-commit. So I'm Arthur Rio, I'm CTO at Notivize. We have built a notification system platform so that you don't have to build your own. And uh, if you need notifications with complicated rules, multiple channels, templates, uh, make sure to check it out. And if you or someone you know loves uh, code quality as much as I do and uh, wants to join an early seed funded startup, please uh, reach out to me. Uh, the slides, configuration samples, and code examples will be available at that uh, GitHub repo. And I'll put the links in Slack and in the chat as well at the end of the talk. So first, we're going to about, talk about tools. Uh, we have formatters and linters, mostly. The formatters will uh, make modification to your code. Uh, so you know, make sure you save your changes. And if you use Git, make sure you stage your changes before you run those tools so that you can see easily the diff of what has been applied to your code and what are the different uh, style changes you can see. Um, and why are formatters important? Well, uh, you probably do pull, pull request reviews, uh, and it's really annoying when you have to do uh, comments on styling, and it's not pleasant either as uh, the person giving the, the pull request review or the person receiving the feedback uh, from someone. So if you can use a tool to automate that, then you take all the emotion aspect out of it. And it's uh, really, you can focus your uh, pull request review on uh, the code logic itself and the structure of the code as opposed to just the style, which is not really the most important thing. Um, and the second big aspect is that it will increase the um, consistency in your code base and it will dramatically uh, improve the readability of your code. So. Uh, that's why I really enjoy using formatters. The first one is iSort. It will help you organize your imports uh, based on the standards. So first you'll have the standard library imports, then you'll have third party imports, and finally the local and application imports. And it will order everything alphabetically as well. Then you have black, which will help. Um, so with black, you have a maximum line length by default of 88. You can change that as we'll see later, uh, but it will, help you keep your code within that margin uh, between 0 and 88. And it will format everything nicely for you and very consistently. Uh, it will keep line breaks, quotes the same across your code base. It will help with spacing between your functions and your function methods, uh, between your class definitions. It will help with trailing commas uh, and all changes like that. Uh, and finally, you have Flint, which uh, especially if you come from an older code base, for example, to Python 2.7, it will help you um, move everything to uh, F strings. So if you use the dot format syntax or the person uh, sign syntax to uh, do string formatting, then you can convert all of that to F strings, which in my opinion are way more legible. Then uh, we have linters. Um, Bendit, uh, so linters as opposed to formatters won't change your code. They will just give you warnings and errors. And uh, Bandit uh, is about security. It will give you alerts about uh, potential leaks of API keys, passwords, and tokens based on the name of your variables. It will warn you about using unsafe packages like random or pickle or algorithms that are weak in terms of security like MT5. Uh, it will warn you about bad file permissions. So if one of your Python script has um, executable permissions, for example, also warn you, if you use Django, for example, and you use the safe, mark safe um, command, then it will warn you about that to make sure that you don't have a user input that maybe you shouldn't be trusting. Then uh, we have Flakate, which in my opinion is the most important tool you need to set up. Uh, it will warn you about unused and undefined variables, unused and missing imports, wildcard imports, missing uh, formatting arguments, uh, function redefinition, so if you have two functions with the same name or two methods with the same name, it will warn you. Uh, if you override a variable, uh, for example, if you have uh, an argument uh, of your function that, you know, for loop, you, re you reuse that same name, it will warn you about it. Um, and also, Flakate comes with a lot of plugins that you can install on top of it, such as Flakate doc string, uh, Flakate uh, built-in, Flakate, um, eradicate, 
uh, lots of them. Uh, you can search for awesome Flake 8 extensions and on GitHub, and you'll see a list of all of them. Uh, it's really neat. Then we have MyPy. So if you use type annotations in your code, even if it's only for documentation, you want them to be correct. And I really recommend running MyPy to make sure that, yes, you've defined a type in your function or uh, a variable, and make sure that it's actually th the right thing. And finally, we have, we're have we going to automate all of that using pre-commit. Uh, pre-commit, uh, since its origin uh, has evolved a lot and now supports pretty much any Git hooks you can think of. So pre-commit, post-commit, uh, pre-push, post-push, uh, anything you can think of. Uh, I only use pre-commit personally. Um, and also what's cool with this tool is that you can use it for other languages. So if you have uh, JavaScript in your code, uh, as well as Python, you can use the same tool. Um, now let's talk about the configuration. So a very important point is that all of those tools have very, very thoughtful uh, defaults. So you shouldn't need to tweak them too much. Uh, and if you manage multiple projects, then you're going to spend a lot of time keeping them in sync if you make a lot of tweaking, um, which can lead to inconsistent code, which is not what you want. Uh, so I really recommend to try to stick to the defaults. And obviously, if you can, then change it, but try to stick to the defaults. Black only supports configuration through the pyproject.toml configuration file. And uh, more and more tools start to um, support pyproject.toml, but not all of them. Uh, but I think that's the most used one. So I would recommend it. I know that for some libraries that use setup.py, uh, there might be some conflicts, but I think you can work around them. Um, so uh, in my opinion, in my use case, the only thing I change is the line length because I still can do side-to-side -side comparison with the line length of one pretty, but uh, you have to be uh, careful about if you do open source, People with uh, site disabilities might you know, have bigger fonts, and maybe 120 is too much. So the default is 88, um, but it's really a, a preference. But I would say if you find what works for you, set it and don't change it. Then we have iSort. Uh, same, it su supports spyproject.toml as well, but it also supports other configuration files. Um, and if you use it with black, the really key thing is to use the profile black so that they don't conflict with each other. Otherwise, black will make a change. I thought will revert it uh, or the other way around. And um, you'll end up with no change in your diff. And still, uh, you'll see an error from your, link, uh, for, from your formatters. And you'll be wondering why. So make sure you use that profile. Use the line links that matches the, the one you've set for black. And finally, make sure you uh, set the skip git ignore. Otherwise, if you have folders like uh, non-modules, I thought will happily go in there and reformat everything, which is not very useful. Flint uh, is pretty great. There is nothing to configure. Just run it. It's great. Bandit configuration is a little bit painful. Uh, you have to be aware of there is an ini file and there is a yaml config file, and they do different things. Personally, I only use the uh, ini file, which I, uh, the name of the file I use is .bendit. And I'll show you later how to uh, pass it as an argument to use it. Um, and here I just specify my targets, uh, which are my folders uh, I want bendit to check. And the one thing I always skip is B101, uh, which is uh, the use of asset statements. It warns you because uh, if you compile your code, then all the asset statements will be removed. And so it could change the behavior of your code. So you have to be aware of that. And uh, to silence those alerts, you can uh, either do it line by line with the no sec uh, comment at the end of the line, and you pass the code of the error. So that's what I recommend. It's like saying, it's like putting your stamp on it and saying, OK, I know there is a warning. I'm aware of it, but it's fine. Uh, I, I put the ignore statement. Then we have Flake 8. And uh, here I want to show you that if you install Flake 8 plugins, they will all live under the same banner. 
Uh, unfortunately, Flaky doesn't support PyProject.toml yet uh, for legacy code reasons. They need to reshape a little bit how they do configuration to be able to support it. But uh, you can use the .flake8 file and again, match the line links you uh, had for black and eyesore. And then uh, we would recommend using uh, extend ignore as opposed to just ignore uh, so that you keep the defaults. And the defaults being things that you really don't want to deal with, like um, the one where you have the uh, line break before the uh, binary operator, which will conflict with black and uh, is not actually uh, pip8. Uh, it doesn't work with pip8 either. Uh, another tip is to put y. Uh, so here I just put the what the code stands for, but in your code you could uh, also just put a line to explain why you use that code. It's very helpful when you go back because just looking at codes uh, you might not remember and having to go dig through the documentation is not helpful either. And finally, I want to show that uh, all the plugin configuration will also leave here. And so uh, Flake here it's a configuration for Flake dark strings and same for D1. D1 is an error code that was added by the plugin Flake dark strings. Oops, sorry. Um, now we have MyPy. Uh, so depending on if you build an application or if you are just writing a library, you might not need the MyPy, MyPy path. I use it in applications mostly uh, when I have a source folder and at the same level, a test folder. And uh, the SRC folder will be added to my Python path. And so I need to tell MyPy that, yeah, that's one of the root folder and uh, look for the imports in there. The show, show error codes is very helpful so that it will give you things like arc type. So when it complains about an error, it will give you that name. So if you decide to ignore it, then you have the exact code that you can use uh, in your ignore comment. And under that, you have the overrides. I use it mostly to ignore missing imports for libraries I know I don't have the stubs for. And I use the notation with a dot star so that uh, not only import package will be ignored, but also from package import something. Um, for pre-commit, you have different um, ways to configure it. You can either point at the GitHub repository of the tool and specify the version. They will have a dot pre-commit hook config file uh, that has a bunch of defaults. So it's nice to have the defaults but what I don't like is that you have to specify a version. And if you also have dev requirements uh, that you install with a pip, then it might end up uh, getting out of sync. So what I would recommend is to put all those uh, tools in your dev requirements, install them with pip, and then just point pre-commit at those so that they are in sync, they're always the same, and uh, it works pretty well. So for that, you need to set repo local and then you define your hooks. You need an ID that will be used by pre-commit internally. Then you need a name. That's what will be um, on the screen when pre-commit uh, runs. That's what you will see on the display. The entry is the name of the executable. The types is on what type of files you want this check to run. Uh, so you can see all of those checks will only run on Python file. So if I commit only a TXT file, it won't run. And the language Python is just to help pre-commit set up the hooks properly. Uh, you can see that you can pass arguments to your uh, executables. So for example, for Flint, you have to use fail on change. Otherwise, it would say, oh, there's a change. It will make the change, but it will say, it's, it's good. And so your commit will go through, but you'll have uh, unstaged changes in your code. And finally, at the bottom here, you can see that uh, I'm using some uh, kind of built-in tools from pre-commit. And I uh, always fix the end of my file so that there is a new line at the end of the files and I remove all the training white spaces. Um, here is how I write my uh, dev requirements. I use a tool called pip tools. And so I only put my uh, top level requirements with their versions in a dev requirements that in, then I would run pre um, sorry, pip compile that would generate a dev requirements.txt file with all the, those dependencies and also all the sub dependencies uh, with a pinned version. 
Now, how do you use it? So first of all, the, the most critical thing is to set it up in your ID. Like all those tools that you've installed, set it up in your ID. They all support it. It's pretty easy to set up. It'll, it'll save you a lot of time um, when you're developing to have that feedback directly in your ID. That's where you spend most of your time anyway. So that's my first advice. Set it, take the time to really set it up in your ID or your editor. Then install the pre-commit hook. So as I said, it's better to have it as part of your dev requirements.txt. And so it's always installed with the rest of your tools. Uh, but you can also just do pip install pre-commit. Then you will run pre-commit install, which will set up the Git hooks for you. And so for example, here, if I'm using a pre-commit hook, then as soon as I write that message, git commit something, uh, all the checks will be run. Here is an example of uh, I committed some bad tests. You can see that all my formatters were correct and they didn't complain, they passed. But my linters did fail. So in that case, what would happen is that the commit is just rejected. I don't have any code change, but it's my, it, I need to go in and fix all of those issues before I can actually commit. Here's an example where everything passed. So that's when you're happy. Here is an example where I only pre, uh, committed a PNG file, so all the Python checks just were skipped, which is really awesome because uh, pre-commit is really fast. Uh, so it doesn't slow down your development uh, habits, uh, and that's why I, I really enjoy using it. Um, so for continuous in integration, uh, make sure you set that up. Make sure you do pre-commit run all files because that's kind of your line, last line of defense before the code makes it into your code base. Um, and developers could either forget to install the pre-commit hook, or they could run a git commit dash dash no verify, which would skip the um, git hooks. So make sure you have that last line of defense. And also, you can just run it, run that exact command um, if you want to. If you don't want to commit, you can just run that command, and it will check you locally in your terminal. So to recap. Uh, make sure you discuss it with your team and plan a rollout. Run the formatters and the linters. So either you do you pick one tool, you run it, you fix all the things, and then make sure you add the equivalent pre-commit uh, configuration and you set up pre-commit so that you don't have code regressions. Uh, and yeah, then it's up to you based on the size of your code base if you want to run all of them at once or if you want to add one after the other. Um, that really depends on the size of the code base, I would say. And I have a tip for you in the next slide on how to keep the git blame intact, even though you have a big commit with a big reformatting. Um, and so, as I said, like, make sure you set up pre-commit to avoid regressions and then do a brown bag with your team. Make sure they are all set up with their IDs, their editors, and make sure they all have uh, pre-commit installed. I have some additional results. So here, the first link uh, will tell you how to do that, how to ignore that big commit with all that uh, reformatting so that you can do git blame and just skip through that commit and see what was there before. Uh, a Flake 8 awesome plugin list. Um, and then pre-commit CI, which uh, has been developed by um, Anthony Satili, which is a creator of pre-commit. It's very fast. It's pretty cheap. Uh, it's free for open source, so please check it out. And uh, recently, three episodes came out talking about the tools I talked today uh, in testing code by Brian O'Kan and uh, in Python Bytes by Michael Kennedy and Brian O'Kan. Uh, so respectively, episode 156 is um, Flake 8, 157 is uh, pre-commit, and the Python Byte uh, episode is about uh, pip tools. I mean, talks about pip tools.